than he faces. A potential witness list for the prosecution shows about a dozen people could take the stand, from Stormy Daniels to Michael Cohen to former Trump White House aides and Trump Organization employees. Joining us now is former federal prosecutor and MSNBC legal analyst Carol Lamb. Carol, as we gear up for jury selection tomorrow, walk us through how this is going to go. What can we expect? Well, what you can expect tomorrow morning, Anna, is that there are going to be some motions that probably both sides raise, you know, lawyers are very good at coming up with little twists and turns that they want the judge to decide before the jury is actually brought in. And there's always a bit of frenetic activity that starts uh, just before a, a trial gets underway. And that's because the lawyers want to have uh, all of these issues sort of ruled on by the judge before the jury is actually brought in. Because once the jury is brought in, a certain formality sort of takes over the courtroom and uh, you don't have time for a lot of rabble rousing. So expect some of that to happen before jury selection actually gets underway. And then you're going to have quite a few days of jury selection um, because of, of all the fraud issues here. And then once the jury is selected, uh, then opening statements will actually begin. Thousands of potential jurors have been summoned. The, the jury questionnaire we know has 42 questions. Some are multi-part and, and really get at whether prospective jurors are pro or anti-Trump without actually asking how they vote. What are the, the key questions do you think that jurors need to answer? Well, certainly some of the more obvious ones. What what um, associations do they have? Are they a member, for example, of the Proud Boys? That's that's an obvious question. Um, they, the, the parties do avoid asking questions that, of course, they would love to have answered. Who did you vote for, for example? That's not a question that a judge is going to allow on a jury questionnaire. But sometimes it goes into sort of what sort of news shows do you watch? What sort of uh, literature do you read? And how familiar are you with the issues in this case? Because both parties are trying to determine whether a predetermination has been made by the jury about the guilt or innocence of the defendant. Michael Cohen is expected to be perhaps the star witness for the prosecution because he was directly involved in those payments to Stormy Daniels. And the jury will have to make a judgment on his credibility. Here's Cohen this weekend right here on MSNBC. You see, one of the things that Donald and his legal team are trying to do is every day it's to discredit me. And they think that that's a winning strategy for getting a, an overturn uh, of whatever conviction that a jury may or may not determine. That's not the way that you run a trial. Have your own defense. The defense is not to attack the witness, but that's what they think is going to be the successful uh, result for them. Carol, what's your take on that? Well, of course, attacking the prosecution's witness is a defense strategy, and it's used frequently because it is the prosecution that has the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt to prove the guilt of the defendant. But in this case, Michael Cohen is really, he's more of a narrator of the story because the prosecution does have a lot of other evidence. They have the checks that were actually signed by Donald Trump, one check even when Donald Trump had already been president of the United States. They have the, they're going to have the testimony of all the players that took part in this scheme to have money go to Stormy Daniels in return for her silence um, about the affair. So you need to have somebody who sort of knows the story from beginning to end. And because the checks were written to Michael Cohen, he is the one to tell the story. But then this is true for all cooperators that prosecutors put on the witness stand. You know, there's there is a, uh, a saying that plots hatched in hell don't have angels for witnesses. Uh, you have to be able as a prosecutor to corroborate everything that the cooperating uh, witness says. And that's what they're going to have to do with Michael Cohen. Trump went after Cohen on social media this weekend, calling him disgraced attorney, a felon. Does that violate the gag order that says he can't attack witnesses? Well, no, I think that does technically violate the um, the the order, the gag order, uh, because there was a, the the prosecution has been very clear about who's going to be called as a witness, and Michael Cohen is on that witness list. But I think the judge has a little bit. Um, of a harder time with this one because Michael Cohen has been so publicly out there criticizing Donald Trump uh, very, very recently. And so I think that it's a little bit tougher for the judge 
to come down and uh, punish Donald Trump for violating that gag order, although it is technically a violation of the gag order. This judge has a lot of things to do, and Michael Cohen seems to be out there sort of taking care of himself. Uh, mm -hmm. He's he's not a witness who is uh, shying away from the cameras, so uh, we'll have to see what the judge decides to do in this case. Trump on Friday said he would absolutely testify in his own trial. He's not required to. Do you think that would be in his own best interest? And I think we're all uh, pretty much agreed on the legal analyst side that Donald Trump is not taking the stand in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also not surprised that he's saying he will take the stand because it it's meaningless to him to say uh, whether he is or isn't going to take the stand at this point if he decides not to take the stand. Uh, and that would probably be the wiser thing to do in this case because he has made so many statements. And uh, once he decides to testify, the door is kind of open for the prosecution just to get in there and expose his inconsistencies and, and falsehoods and lies in the past. Um, but he will ultimately say, I'm not taking